Men to be fast with all those mates. Come here, I tell you, man. Isn't it not? Isn't it not healthy to eat cornflakes all the time? Isn't it not? I mean, get up in the morning and have cornflakes. At dinner, I will have cornflakes. At tea, I will have cornflakes. I'm pulling into cornflakes. I'm turning into a bleak cornflakes. Should be an ad for fucking catalogs, man. No, like the dinners. All right, all right. Money for that. Many of us may have watched the series of programmes on the joy, but we didn't need to see that programme to realise that our largest prison uh, was in chaos, that it was completely unable to cope uh, with the pressures that had been put on it. We didn't need to see that film to know that more people come out of Mount Joy suffering from drug addiction than go into it. There's not in the prison or outside the prison, and I would never say, or I would never allow anybody to say that we have adequate resource in Mount Shaw. Of course we have adequate resource in Mount Shaw. And the old triangle When jingle the jangle All along the banks of the royal When you come into prison, you come into a community, you have to live with that community, you have to work with the people in the community, the staff have to work with the prisoners. And we just have to get on with it, you know, the Mountjoy prison has been in existence since 1850, which is 168 years. Keeping a prison like that going 24-7, 365 days a year is, is a tough job. They need to address their offending behaviour and we need to provide those uh, avenues in which to do that and make them better people when they're leaving the prison than when they're coming in in order to provide safer communities for the public. Prison itself is, is uh, you know, it is based on the old radial system of a circle, or a semi-circle, more, uh, more accurately, and four wings radiating off the circle area. And uh, on the left-hand side, as you go into prison, the A division is, is, it is known as the A division. It houses people who have been in prison on a previous occasion. In the B division, uh, the people who are on remand are housed, along with the, uh, a section of the B basement. So, and they are by and large kept separate as much again as we can. B base numbers, please. Thank you. Medical unit numbers, please. Thank you. Separation unit numbers, please. No, would you double check that? 40 is given against you. Very good, okay. Ryan Lock! Ryan Lock! I think I put on a few pounds and aged a little bit since 1996, but this is a, a photograph that would have been taken um, back back then. It's my ID. It's still the same one that's used to this day. Back in 1996, I think it would have been the class officer back in the B base at the time. The main holding cells of the prison were about down there. It was an extremely busy area back in 96. The numbers would have been very, very high back then. We were talking around the, the 800 mark. The, the majority of the overcrowding has um, eased, although we're going through a period at the moment, just as, as we speak, of uh, very high numbers in the system at the moment throughout, not only just Mount Joy. One of the biggest changes in the job that I have seen is the uh, protection prisoner uh, element of the population now. This morning's numbers here in Mount Joy, we have 652 prisoners in total in the prison. Of that, of that 652, 202 of those are on protection. We have factions from most of the, the different um, gangs that are spread around the country at the moment. 
There's numerous smaller gangs around the place. Generally, they'll be affiliated to one of the bigger um, groupings, but th there's so many different factions out there. And behind me here now, we have the A Division, and this side here is the B Division. Both these divisions now are completely uh, populated by prisoners who are on uh, protection. Um, different issues, uh, issues on the outside, um, drug issues. Even within the protection element, there is a requirement for segregation. So we have something like uh, 14 different factions here this morning who all have to be let out separately. We only have so many exercise yards, so many recreation halls that we can uh, put these prisoners into, so they have to be timetabled. When prisoners want to get out and make phone calls, that's another issue. Uh, we have to rotate them around, so some get out early in the morning, others get out late at night. We have to be cognizant of what's going on outside in the community at the moment as well. As we're all aware, there's, there's quite a lot happening outside, and any issue that kicks off outside in the community could have ramifications for us inside here in the prison as well. We have our operations support group and they gather all the intelligence um, on the different prisoners that we have and they will keep us up to date on the type of prisoner, who we have in, who they're affiliated to, who they're uh, feuding with. They work in close contact with uh, our operations directors in headquarters and the Garda Liaison and Protection Division up in the Phoenix Park. I don't think it um, affects the female officer working in a, in a male-dominated environment in general. I think, by and large, we're given a very uh, fair run uh, of all the different uh, jobs in the prison system that were class officers. We work on the main gate, we work in the general office. Um, we work in all other areas where the Equality Act allows us to work. I'm 27 years now in the job. I was class officer in 1996. There would have been about 50 prisoners on that particular landing. My job at the time was to lock and unlock them, look after, you know, if they, they got clothes in from reception and, and just that that particular landing was well run um, and the prisoners weren't disruptive. Welcome back to D Division, D1, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where you were yeah, working here 26, 27 years ago? Yeah, um, exactly. I started in September 1990 and was a class officer within uh, a year um, on, on D1 and, and had did about four years as a class officer here. It's a lot different than it was back in It's an awful 1990s. lot different, you know. I mean, look at the, the flooring alone. The red and white tiles are gone and... The smell is yeah, gone. Yeah. It's gone. It's exceptionally clean. You go down and you slap out in a chamber pot, which is degrading enough. And then you'd find the rubbish, the excrement overflowing. You'll have to wait till that's cleared. You go back to your cell then. Then you'll find you get ready to slap out get your dirty water. You get clean water to wash in your cell. You, were out, you slap out your rubbish. So all this rubbish, all this human excrement that's lying on the floor, the dirty toilet rolls, blood, vomit, is all there before you have your breakfast. Then you rush, you rush down to your breakfast and you get your breakfast and you blank out what you see now in your mind. So the mental torment is there then, from the world go from 8.15 in the morning and that prepares you for the day then. So you go back to your cell, then you have your breakfast, you wash, you shave, whatever you have to do, clean up your cell. Well, in 1996, there were approximately 750 prisoners in Mount Joy, so that was about 200 over what they could manage. Um, so it was organised chaos in my world, um, especially as a junior officer, but somehow it did work. The single biggest change, though, has been the single cell policy that we operate here now mm. and the in-cell sanitation that's in place. Um, you know, everybody now has their own in-cell sanitation and that has just transformed the place, you know. Cheers, thank you. This is the size of the cell. You'll notice the in-cell sanitation and the modesty screen and all yeah. that's been put in. Yeah. Different from your time. Completely different. I mean, you know, there could have been two people, one on the floor. If it was a bunk bed, you could have had bunk bed plus somebody on the floor. There wasn't even room for a toilet, obviously.
we're a committal prison. We receive committals in here every day. And we 17 yesterday, Chief, I think, and 12 this before. Morning. We, we have nine this morning. I mean, as you know yourself, at the moment, the numbers are very high everywhere. Yes. So everybody's trying to, to juggle their, their, their numbers around and, and move uh, uh, prisoners around about the place. My own opinion is that the ordinary viewer is not too worried about Mount Joy as long as the doors are locked. People often forget, as well as being prisoners, they're also people. They're just like anyone else. And uh, the easiest thing sometimes to do is just uh, shut the door and say, well, they're locked up, I can sleep well for the night. If, when we get prisoners in here, if they're helped in some way to be somewhat rehabilitated, there is a possibility they won't come back again. They'll decide to live another life free from crime. I think the role of a chaplain is very important because the spiritual dimension, I found the prisoners to be very spiritual people. But if you're on the border of life and death all the time, it's quite, it's quite an attraction to become a spiritual individual. Um, and most of them had uh, no problem with the concept of God in an afterlife because the fear existed among themselves of each other. They were very careful and turned their back on each other and the judge the fell it through his eyes. I suppose 90% of the work would, would be just to, to be there and to walk among them. In the morning, we'd go and we'd walk to different landings and the blocks, prison blocks, and um, see if anyone wants us. Sometimes it's just a matter of taking a phone number and ringing up a person's family or a friend and delivering a message. And sometimes it's more. It's just to be there, to be present, Will you check that out? Okay. I'll check it out. You had the odd prisoner when I was working in the Joy who would have been older than 40. But they were the odd ones. The majority were younger. Uh, <clears throat> remember, 40 is an old age if you're an addict. Why are you saying blogs coming into this jail that didn't even take fucking drugs when they come in here? But when they come in here, they just start getting into it because it's just the in thing, isn't it? It's the 90s. Mount Joy. Many of you mention Mount Joy to someone out in the street. They're obvious they're going to fucking think, oh, Mount Joy drugs. I could, as minister, very easily deny every time we're asked that there are any drugs in the prison. And it might make my life a little bit easier. But that would not be the truth. So we all know drugs get into our prisons. And so it is time that we faced up to that reality and assisted in removing drugs from our prison uh, and provide treatment for people who are quite literally a captive audience whilst they're under my care as Minister for Justice in our prisons. Drugs coming into prisons is, is a problem not just here but across all jurisdictions. You know, you'll, you'll always have it uh, in prisons. A debt in custody in a prison, like, you know, isn't usually related to a drug overdose. Okay, this is where the centre of the activity is going to be. Uh, this is the nurse's station. Uh, it was originally a, a dental surgery, and we got the dental chair removed. All these presses were already built in. Um, we have a little unit off the nurse's unit where we're going to store the urine sampling and we'll have a terminal there to get the urine results back from the laboratory on a daily basis. Through here is the bathroom where we will take the urine samples. They're going to be supervised urine samples. Down this corridor here is the area where the prisoners sleep. The cells are on both sides of the corridors. We can accommodate 12 people. The detox program had just begun in 1996. It was the first dedicated uh, drug treatment program in Mountjoy Prison. The plan was to take six or eight patients, um, prisoners, every six weeks and to um, detoxify them from their drugs and then that they would uh, continue um, a journey from the detox unit onto the training unit and from there they would be released from the community. The prisoners on this landing are 
uh, involved in slow detox and stabilization. We wouldn't have had this 22 years ago when we opened the original program, we only had the one program. So we have four landings in total and three of them are slow detox stabilization and then we have the one landing F5, which was the original drug treatment program. There's a total capacity now of 36 patients compared to nine patients when we opened first 20 years ago. So that's four times as many, so that's good news. The detox program in Mount Joy was a program of its time because you must remember back in 1996, the idea of having methanol maintenance as treatment in uh, the prison was very, very controversial and not very supported. But still there wasn't the political will to introduce methadone, so that didn't come really until 2000. So this program, I think, was a stopgap where there was a recognition that there was particularly opioid use in the prison and that something had to be done about it. Okay, and you're struggling a little bit on that, are you? Yeah, like I have cancer as well, you know? Okay. Are you, you're getting treatment for that? See? Okay, well, that looks... So look, I'm going to bring you up to 100 mils, okay? So you'll be getting that from tomorrow. Uh, if you need to go further, you can pop into me next week, okay? I'll be here next Wednesday. Sleep, no, we don't give out, no, we don't give out sleeping medication. That's the policy of the prison. No, we don't. So I go into the prison one day a week and uh, I look after the methadone maintenance program there. Also then we look after the prisoners in the detox unit and uh, any medication they require to cope with their withdrawals, we would prescribe that. Are you linking with the counsellor at the moment? We asked him to be linked in with the addiction counsellor when I was coming off the methadone that one, and I still haven't been caught with the addiction okay. And uh, did you ever think of coming over to the medical unit and doing up? That's what I have a plan to do. And did you have an assessment for that? No. no. Okay. I'm going to go out in the next couple of months. Will I put you down to have an assessment? Yeah. OK, Damien, so that's fine. You'll be started back tomorrow, OK? The yep. pattern of drug Take use care. has changed. Now we see a range of substances, particularly tablets, benzodiazepines, different types of sleeping tablets, Z-hypnotics. They are usually homemade tablets that are brought in from China. So nobody has a clue what uh, is inside in these tablets, what strength they are. They really send them off their heads altogether when they get their hands on these things because there really is no uh, idea of what's in these things at all. Maybe. 60, 70 or more percent involved in drug-related crime uh, and then they are drug ad addicted. Even back then in 1996, like it was 80% involved in, in, in uh, drug-related crime and I say it's even higher today, that statistic would have grown. Look, like I'm at the down an eight day month sentence, then a two year, and now a three year. I'm just finished a three year, and to me, I'm at the being out there already. I'm only at the coming back. Today, you know what I mean? I'm only at the coming back from the outside, and I know what I have to do. It's up to me. If I want to make a walk out there, I'll make a walk. If I want to go back onto drugs, I can go back onto drugs. But I, I know the consequences of it. It's down to me at the end of the day. Prison, in my mind, does not prepare a person for something outside of the prison system. If I go in as an addict into prison, um, what chance have I got? You can say go on a drug free program. Very difficult. Very difficult. Hello, Mountjoy Prison. Yeah, I can give you the number for visits. They're open Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday. They're open from 10 to 12, 2 to 4. OK, thank you. Bye. I have all the cameras in front of me. I have radios here, so I hear all the radios all around the campus. So if there's trouble, it comes up here straight away as an alarm. And we have all the cameras, which I can switch cameras around at all times during the day, if we have visits on or if the yards are on. If there's trouble somewhere in a yard, I can call for staff to go straight to the yard. And I can tell them exactly what's happening, how many prisoners are involved if there's staff or anything involved. Your number, That's it. 
There's a chap just finishing there now. Make sure he's uh, searched. He has it on the back of his trousers. Back in 1996, there was less of an emphasis now on the technological uh, tools that we use. Um, and I suppose in some respects, we've, we've replaced prison officers with cameras. I suppose on the Mount Joy campus, there will be nearly close to about 800 to, to 850 cameras on the whole campus, um, which we do depend on, which the Gardaí do depend on as well, because they have to investigate crimes that happen in here in prison, and, and crimes do happen in prison, you know. We've had serious incidents where staff have been assaulted, staff have been slashed, um, seriously assaulted, and we do come down hard on prisoners that do that. When the Irish Prison Service was set up as a governing body over and above the Department of Justice, they introduced a tighter, more restricted access at every gate of every prison in the country. Yep. Right. No, do you have any coins, keys, back to the recorder? No, but Okay, put them into the box, yeah. And, uh, when the officer calls you. Okay, go ahead. We have a, a terrible problem at the moment with mobile phones coming into the, the prison these days, which wasn't the case back in 1996. Here's a sample, just a few of the, the, the phones that we have found inside. That is just your, your normal mobile phone that I think everybody would be familiar with. One of the next ones we have here is this phone here. Looks just like an ordinary car key fob, but when you turn it around, it's a mobile phone. Very easy to conceal, very hard to detect. One of the most common that we are finding at the moment is the little long CZ. And we are finding quite a, a number of those around the prison at the moment. Um, and it is, again, it's causing a, a major problem for us. But as you can see from that, it's literally only the size of your little finger. They can be worth anything from 500 euro to 1,000 euro. And if you're caught with one of these, um, you can face up to five years in prison. Um, but as well as that, the owner of the phone will come looking for their money and even your family on the outside will be put under pressure to pay for the, the loss of the phone. It must be replaced, it must be paid for. When I got nicked, when the old bill nicked me uh, and I was in the police station and I knew that I was coming back into joy. Um, I don't know, I was just known, I was uh, horrified, you know, it's it horrible. Uh, here we go again, you know. I've been in before and, and uh, just the whole thing that look, I'm not being caught robbing again and, 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 and the whole thing with drugs and, and, and going back into jail and, and probably blowing everything with my family that's after taking, you know, it's after taking me a boy to get it back with them and, and it's gone again. When I was a um, class officer back in 1996, um, I had a, a prisoner working on the landing called John. He was an, an exceptional type of a person in that while he was a serious heroin addict, he was really gentle, you know, he was completely different to some of the heroin abusers back then. He was intelligent, he was respectful, he w there was no aggression in the man at all. Every time you come into jail, you walk your own little system. You, you know, you hear people saying, fuck the system and, and, and stuff like that. And, and the way it is, is you, you don't fuck the system, you just get your own little system together where you can get your washing done maybe for 10 smokes or a bit of hash or whatever. Um, you can get some extra food out of the kitchen, decent food instead of the regular food. 173. I've got to stop thinking about me, um, the Bobby and, and my girl and my family and, and, and the shit that I'm after leaving outside, you know, which I, I did leave an awful lot of shit outside. You'd always say, there go I but for the grace of God, because he wasn't the representative of, of what we would prejudicially look at as a heroin addict. New survey. Is it six? Yep. He could have been anything in life, but unfortunately he chose that particular path and came in and out for many years afterwards, but I, I know he has sadly passed. And, but it would only be with fondness that you could remember him. So this is it. Cheers. I mean, any time I've come into jail is because I've committed crime to get money for drugs. It doesn't do our self-esteem any good. It takes lumps out, you know, it takes lumps out of me. Uh, I think it takes lumps out of everybody. And some people show it and some people don't, but uh, yeah, it's not nice at all. You know? 
Yeah. <laughs> it's... There is a very high morbidity and mortality associated with heroin addiction and opioid addiction. People die of overdose, people die of HIV, or did die of HIV in the past, they die of hepatitis C, and we would see that within the prison population. Any updates or issues over the last week in the medical unit, Governor, and thing? No issues this week reported to us, no. Great, and they'll have their onwards placements hopefully? We will, we'll have it next week hopefully, yeah. And uh, how are the people in the middle of the floor doing the prisoners, the slow detox and the yeah. any issues? No, they're all uh, keeping quiet, they're all getting ready for the next course, looking forward to it. Looking Good. forward to the recommendations of the head man and all the other staff. So how many people do we have waiting for assessment? There was a huge amount of injecting uh, in the prisons, so the harm associated with that and the risk of HIV and hepatitis C transmission was enormous. Yeah, we just got a test on there last week, you know. Yeah, something, something for HIV, negative, right? Something, something for HIV, one, one, two, negative, you know. I was well pleased with that result, you know what I mean? Like, after taking the risks, like, I have taken risks in here, you know what I mean, heavy risks. I've been down that road where they've come in, you know what I mean? They're coming in and they're doing sick. It's an angiogism, you know what I mean? Now, myself personally, not that it bothers me, I have hepatitis, which most people using a needle get. I'm not sure about the virus, but most of this prison have hepatitis, and then there's maybe a quarter who have the virus as well. On one land, there's maybe 150 prisoners. You're lucky if there's 10 workers. If one of them has the virus, if one person out has the virus out at and that works is being used, do you know, even if you clean a work, virus covers virus. HIV will cover HIV in a works. HIV infection in the mid-90s was an enormous problem. There was a huge amount of fear and stigma attached to the infection. Potential uh, risk that infected people were to staff and uh, consequently um, that led to segregation of the uh, prisoners. Oh yeah, there's been a lot of that, yeah. Like from 1995 up until now. But that's a pain that uh, a lot of us done in 1985. Over in the... The, it's called the segregation unit you know, at that time it was, you know. The teacher asked us that day what we were feeling about the virus, so that's what that painting is about, how we feel about the virus, and I know, like, if we feel sad, if we feel indecisive. There's a few of the people that done that are dead now. Like, we could name uh, three that done that, and they're dead now, you know. Um, there is some people that are still alive who've done the paintings on that. I'm one of them. But the HIV treatment landscape has changed enormously. So it's no longer an acute infection that people died of. It's now a chronic infection that's managed like any other chronic infection. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why people should die of HIV disease anymore. Um, the, if they're compliant and taking medication, they, they're not infected, infected to other people. So, uh, so like we have all our HIV positive prisoners are now integrated into the main prison population. And, you know, they would have um, access to all the treatment services, access to the hospital consultants, and would have very high compliance with their medication while they're in prison. Now, we do still find a few needles in around the place now, but it's not for injecting the likes of heroin and uh, drugs like that. They use them more for steroids. Um, so so that they're few and far between, uh, thankfully. Whereas beforehand, they were, they were ten a penny. Is there any other issues that people want to raise? What's the situation with overcrowding in the women's prison? We brought it up at the last meeting. Well, um, it, it continues uh, it to be a fairly... Like well, I know what the summer now didn't eat off that much. <coughs> it was in between 35 and 40 every day. But now that the courts are back, it'll be back up over, over 40. That means accommodation in, in the recreation hall and the use of the padded cells. Which is sort of a new phenomenon in the women's prison is that in the last, it was only arose in the last year, up to that we hadn't had an accommodation crisis with the 40 cells we had. But in the last year it certainly is an ongoing problem. And accommodation, it's not really suitable for 40 people, not mind to say 43 or 4. It just hasn't got the resources or the facilities or the space more than anything else. It's a matter of space. I think if you're going to be punished 
and put into prison, I think you should be rehabilitated. So when you do get out, you don't commit the crime again. Whereas when you're coming in, you're just comparing notes to other people and you're learning more things. And you're going out and you're doing the very same thing again. And prison is only a break for drug addicts. It's a break off the streets. It's away from, for me it is. It's a break. We moved here in 1998 to a purpose-built prison. Very new and innovative ideas. There were houses, there were rooms. We stopped calling them prisoners. We were talking about women in custody who lived in rooms in houses. The women have keys to their doors. So it's sort of trying to normalize the environment as much as possible. Okay, we're in the accommodation now. As you can see, it's a corridor. It still has an institutional feel, but not so much as it did in the old prison. All of the rooms are the very same. They have the same furniture in them shower, toilet, wash hand basin. Some beds are single beds like this. Other times we have a bunk bed in it. Everybody would have a TV and a kettle. There were seven houses and the idea was that women would start off in one area and progress to an area with less supervision as they spent their time in prison and as they proved that they didn't need the level of supervision. Women don't need the level of security that men have. Has everyone got one yet? Yeah. And um, this is part of the wheel of change. We're going to just have a look at first and then we're going to go on and read from this part and talk about it. Starts off with contemplation, that's contemplation, then getting ready, that's getting your support in place. So like going to projects and all, like whether it's NA, whatever works for you. But getting your support in place and all and making a, making a plan to move on with your life. Maintenance, be getting used to all the changes in your life, to all the things that you need to change in order to get there. And especially with recovery, it's always relapse will always be part of it. It just keeps coming back, but it gets easier every time. We had gone from the old prison regime where people were locked up for meal breaks to being out all day, out unlocked at 8 o'clock in the morning, locked back up at 7.30. What did they do? They were used to the old routine where they literally had about two hours to fill of their time. Now they had whole 11 and a half hours and what are they going to do with that? We had communal dining for meals instead of people eating in their cells. It took a lot for the officers to get used to as well. There are a lot of women who come into custody due to addiction issues and they commit small petty crimes. They're the people who come in and out the revolving door. And there's some of them here now who would have been in here 22 years ago. Some of them are coming in probably 30 years and they just can't get off that cycle. There was overcrowding then and there's still overcrowding. And although the number in custody in between men and women are decreasing in general, with women, the number in custody is increasing. How are you? Queen, how are you? Queen, this is the American ambassador. This is Queen. Very nice to meet you. I'd say maybe three quarters of prisoners in the female prison are drug abusers. When I came in, um, I was strung out and I'd done a detox and um, I found for about two weeks after, like, um, I was going through withdrawals. Now, they wouldn't have been as severe as like if I hadn't been given fisetone to come down off the heroin, you know. But it doesn't mean that I don't get cravings for drugs. I do still sometimes, but I find, you know, if I get stuck into something, it takes my mind off and it just goes. Then you forget, you know. No, could I have a takeaway tea, please? Takeaway tea. Yep. I was born in my home in Tyler. And um, we moved around a bit. Got in with the wrong crowd, as they say. You know, I ended up going down the slippery slope. I was involved in drugs with my brother because he would have been on them a lot longer than me. 
And I used to drop him off when he was buying his drugs. But um, I just got curious. I had um, eight sisters and a brother. And five of them has uh, passed away. And they were all in their thirties. So and that was in five years. So like, and I was over in um, Mimjoy. My first admission in Mimjoy, I was seventeen. I was in a couple of times. I was in um, for short times. And then I got uh, four and a half years. Just lift your head up a bit. Yeah. yeah. Just like that. That's it. It wasn't very easy, you know. No. I know when I came off drugs first in here, it was the hardest time, you know. Like over the, the past year, I have had slips, you know, and um, I I did relapse at one stage, um, but I'm trying to get back on track again, you know, because for me it's very important, you know, to, to stay away from drugs because there's a lot depends on it, you know, my own um, personal life, you know. Um, I have a lot to lose, put it that way. If I if I don't stay off drugs, I have a lot to lose, you know. Seven and eight. 78. 2 and 1, 21. When I was in prison, I um, two, tried to keep to myself, two. but I was bullied a bit, you know. Eight and nine, eight and if, I, if I got drugs in, I'd have them all searching me and did kind of follow you around until you gave it to them. So I, I was kind of on my own in prison. I wouldn't get involved in anything. Attempts on suicide has been a few what, since I've been here. Um, and there's been one that was successful. Um, I'm no angel either, you know what I mean? When I came in, I was very depressed as well. And, um, I, I attempted it as well, you know. And sometimes it's only been a stroke of luck that um, somebody might have just looked in the hatch at the right time and um, saved me, you know. But what helped me was was my kids, you know, thinking like them growing up without a mother and then hearing when they're older that she committed suicide in prison. I was very unwell when I was in uh, Mem Joy. I was self harming all the time. He sent me to Dundrum, Central Mental Hospital. I was in uh, Dundrum for uh, 16 years. I actually really loved the place I'm in. It's a home, it's my home. You know, it's um, it's the first home I've ever really had. Well, here we are on C Division in Mount Joy. And it's 11 o'clock at night. On a night duty, an officer would have two landings, one like you see here in the background and one upstairs. And one would start on the ground floor checking each cell individually, turning on the lights. Checking the prisoners in the cell. A lot of cells have two prisoners. Some of the cells here, because of the particular wing we're on, have four prisoners. Just once in my career, a few years ago now, I uh, was involved in one prisoner that hung himself, and I assisted to take him down off the window and uh, assisted the medical orderlies and the other officers in trying to resuscitate him until an ambulance crew arrived and they took over the duties of, of trying to resuscitate the, the inmate. Uh, unfortunately, that inmate in particular died. Uh, we didn't revive him. And neither did the ambulance crew. Uh, it's just one of those things, it, it's a frightening experience.
During our working time, we had one particular group and on their night shifts, I think they had four or five suicides in a very short period of maybe two or three years. And that was like the whole uh, group on nights would only be maybe 18 men. So, I mean, that, that was the whole group affected for four or five times in, in, in that short period of time, which was pretty intense uh, to say that every one of them had been so closely involved in someone's suicide or someone ending their own life. It wasn't the easiest place to live in. When they were living there, I could walk out of the place at evening time. We had a few suicides when I was there, and you'll always have them in that environment. People lose the, the whole concept of hope, you're in trouble. And that's very important as a chaplain's role to make sure that you spread that whole concept of hope. Lose that within a prison, you're in trouble. Another big thing that has happened was the introductions of TVs into the cells. I know an awful lot of people on the outside will say well, they're locked up in prison for committing a crime, why should they have a TV in their cell? But from a prison officer's point of view, I have to say that they were a great asset to us in that they reduced self-harm uh, considerably um, once they were put in. Quite a lot of the inmates who come into Mount Joy, uh, they can't read or write. So when they went to their cell at night time, they had nothing to do looking at four walls and unfortunately um, their mind would go astray, a lot of them would self-harm. Reflecting on the treatment outcomes from the original people that we actually treated in the detox unit, many of those I would have known when they were got released into the community and a lot of them have died, I know that for a fact. Keith, how are things? You want ID? Do you understand this? Yeah? Yeah. Do you want to travel away? Oh, no. <laughs> right. Report on the 24th this day week, right? Yeah. 11 o'clock. Don't be late. Be sober. And be here. Yeah, sure. Be of sober habits. No way, I can't be of sober habits. I came in with a problem, I'm going out with the same fucking problem. And I'm not the only one with that problem. There's your TR, there's your fucking problem. But that's not your answer, you know what I'm saying? That is not your fucking answer. One of the highest risk times in a heroin addict's life is when they leave prison, uh, particularly if they haven't been on methadone treatment because while they're in prison, their tolerance goes down. So when they come leave prison, uh, they expect that they will be able to use the same quantity uh, of drugs that they used prior to incarceration, and in fact they can't, and often they die within the first two to four weeks of release. Thankfully, we're seeing less and less of that because now we have a program where people are maintained on methadone in the prison, and then on release to the community, we have them linked up with the community placement. So that is part of the release scenario, that post-release period that is high risk for people. So by linking them with the clinic and maintaining their tolerance, uh, you're keeping them safe. Okay, Robert, so how are you doing? Not too bad. I'm planning on doing the course. The, the drug treatment course. program. Yeah. Okay, and uh, did you finish your methadone detox in the main did, prison? Yeah. And how are you feeling after that? Yeah, I'm getting there, yeah. Still a bit more to go. So I just want to get up on the course and see how it goes, yeah. And how is your sleep pattern? I'm not sleeping at all. Okay, okay. Mm. So look, we'll give you some medication for that just for the two weeks as I yeah, discussed with you earlier. Yeah. So it's an uh, eight-week program. The first two weeks is just about settling into the program. And if anybody's on methadone, we take them off the methadone and make them mm -hmm. drug-free. And then you have six weeks of uh, intensive uh, counselling and group and that kind of... Yeah. So then what's your plans when you finish the program? I'm planning on going to Kilmore in uh, the day program, yeah. Hey, I'm homeless at the moment, so that helped me get somewhere to live and get me back on my feet. And, and uh, how's the hepatitis C treatment going? It's gone. It's complete, it's yeah. I'm delighted and over the moon, yeah. Now yeah. it's hard to see the day, and here I am. I've done it, I've finished it now, and I'm happy, yeah. And that was for 12 weeks, wasn't it? 12 weeks, yeah, 12 yeah. weeks. The easiest 12 weeks I ever had really? to deal with, yeah. Okay. The treatment for hepatitis C infection has been revolutionised over the last two to three years. Anybody who is hep C infected has an opportunity to have it uh, diagnosed and treated while they're actually incarcerated. Prison, in my mind, does not prepare a person for something outside of the prison system. You can say to punish, to reform, 
In reality, I, the prison system, in my mind, has failed. But you can ask me, uh, what have you got to substitute for it? I can't give you a straight answer. We have to move with the times a little bit, you know, and we have to try and do the best we can to motivate prisoners to engage and rehabilitate themselves. When, when prisoners come into our front gate there, the, the crime they do is put behind them. They're in here, they know in the, in the custody of, of the governor, and it's up to them then to start their journey, addressing the reoffending re behaviour. So it's really about preparing them for when they're getting out again. That's really what prisons are about for me. If you've been affected by issues raised in this programme, please see rte.ie forward slash support. And the old triangle went jingle.